Hi, I'm Othias, and this guy? Well, he's the Japanese Type 35, a naval rifle of rare and exotic nature, and arguably the Arisaka Nambu. But before we get into that, let's get a closer look in the light box. With an overall length of 50.1 inches and weighing in at 9.3 pounds, this is not materially different from the Type 30. Especially when you consider it's still a stripper clip loading, five round staggered flush magazine rifle, chambering the 6.5x50 cartridge. Pretty much dead on, and yet we're still gonna find some beautiful differences. Before we get deeper into it, folks, I'd just like to point out that the reason you're watching this show here on the wide open internet is because there isn't a single traditional media outlet that would take a chance on in-depth firearms history. Instead, we're almost exclusively funded by people like yourself, who took not only an intellectual interest, but a very small financial one. All right, gang, last time we got a lot deeper into the Type 30 than our first rodeo. This was, of course, Japan's first smokeless rifle. Small bore, five round magazine, stripper clip loading, it was supposed to be the perfect blend of features from the two foremost European rifles, along with a dollop of native Japanese engineering spice. Adopted in 1897, the rifle was named for the 30th year of the Meiji Imperial Calendar, although production wasn't truly underway until 1898. Now the Type 30 had been an army project, one headed by an artillery officer, then Lieutenant Colonel Arisaka Nariakira who, by the way, was made full colonel in May of 1897, going on to serve as chief superintendent of the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal. Sadly, Arisaka's rifle wasn't perfect, but the first complaints would not come from the army, but from the navy. While they didn't need nearly as many rifles as the army, the Japanese navy had, since at least 1884, been in the habit of keeping marine contingents on their ships, known as the Special Naval Landing Forces. These were looking to replace their now aged Murata Type 22 black powder tubular magazine rifles with something a bit more modern. Also, the arsenal section wasn't super interested in maintaining black powder production for just the Navy alone. So the Navy would initially go along with the Army, taking in the Type 30 uh, apparently very briefly before finding faults. Unfortunately, most of the archival records concerning Japanese arms development have been lost. Something about a war and a disarmament and massive political change. Anyway, all in the distant future for us at this moment. It's likely we're still in about 1900 and that the Navy was concerned with some faults in the Type 30. While we can't say for sure what was bothering them, the final form of this rifle seems to point out that they had the same concerns that would later bedevil the army several years down the road. That would be during the Russo-Japanese War. This is another one of those interesting times when the victor wasn't entirely happy with his own equipment. And Japan, much like the USA during the Spanish-American War, would take a hard look at their service rifle despite the fact that everything had kind of worked out okay. So, what were the deficiencies? Well, despite being fairly light and flat shooting and with low muzzle flash and low recoil, the Type 30 was prone to breaking extractors and it was susceptible to magazine jams, both from double feeds induced by short throwing the bolt and from exposure to dirt and mud. It was also difficult to service in the field thanks to its complicated bolt with several small pieces and the need to use a special tool for bolt disassembly. Furthermore, despite gas ports in the receiver and the bolt, it was still prone to blowing hot gas back at the shooter if there was a case failure. Just to put us back on our timeline though, the Navy apparently noticed all these issues in their own trials before the Russo-Japanese War, and sometime around 1900 or 1901 asked the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal to address their concerns. Now, you might think that this would all fall back onto Arisaka, but you'd be wrong. Following the adoption of his rifle, Nadia Kira found himself in various command positions, chairman of the artillery council, chief of the weapons investigation section, and superintendent of ordnance depots. All of this, of course, kept him from being so directly involved in arms design again, so another man would have to head up rifle development for the naval program. Thankfully, there was a somewhat younger man around who had thoughtfully designed the muzzle cover for the Type 30 rifle, then Captain Kijiro Nambu. Born September 22, 1869, second son to former Nabeshima samurai and artilleryman Nanbu Haro. Being a former samurai didn't pay well, and Kijiro's mother died soon after his arrival. 
So at age 10, young Kijiro Nanbu was sent to a merchant house to work as a child laborer. Even so, he managed to graduate Saga Junior High School, securing a place in the then new Imperial Army Academy at age 20. He commissioned as an artillery lieutenant at age 23. For our story today, we can skip the particulars and just point out that over his years of service, Nanbu became a competent engineer and was assigned to the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal in 1897. Working under Nariakira Arisaka, Nanbu would be responsible for executing a number of decisions on the then uh, finalizing Type 30 rifle. He was also involved in testing thereafter. It's from that point the timeline gets a bit shaky for me because he would be involved in two projects that released at about the same time. He also managed a couple of promotions, for which I can't find exact dates, achieving the rank of major and becoming a technical director. One of his two initial projects would be the creation of Japan's first automatic pistol. We've thankfully covered this before in a previous episode. The other project is of course our episode today. Thanks to the naval request, Nanbu was put in charge of a team of engineers and dove in on making changes to the Type 30, since we have examples of both it and the Type 35 here, I think we could do a little comparing to see what was on his mind. All right, let's see. Same, 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 different, different, and then same, same, same. Okay, I think we get the idea here. I don't need to cover it any further. No, yeah, let's do it anyway. So if we come up to the front, just like the Type 30, we have a front sight driftable. We have, oh, look, this actually has its rod, brass tip. This is uh, fit down the center of the gun. It's actually threaded on the end, but it also is biased by this spring here that's also holding on the front band a little bit. So you can call it to pop. This one doesn't seem to fit great at the moment, but hey, at least we get the general idea. If we come on down, no upper handguard until boom, there's an upper handguard. And we have a spring uh, retained lower barrel band that's still fairly far forward on the gun, almost in the mid position. I'm not gonna take it apart, but it has that same uh, damper ring that's on the Type 30. That means straight barrel, no steps. If we bring our on down, the handguard suddenly becomes much more different right about here. And that's because we have a different rear sight. One that sort of resembles a certain Austrian quadrant pattern that you might find on say, a. Dutch pattern Monlicker. Hmm, it's almost like Austria was selling this idea and somebody later on bid on it. This honestly was probably sitting in the design bin from the previous Type 30 having been abandoned for the simpler ladder and here it is back. Why? Because it's very rigid and very strong and easy to adjust and read, far less likely to get out of order than a ladder which is easy to bend. Now the way these guys work is pinch and lift, pinch and lift and in an emergency, you can shove that on down. Being the rarer rifle, I'm gonna let it down nice and easy and not wear out those little stands, or throw those little uh, teeth. All right, so let me get you another position. Unlike the previous Type 30, the handguard wraps all the way behind the rear sight, coming right up to, well, something we're gonna talk about in a minute. At the front of the receiver here, there's actually a lip that's inletted to allow the stock underneath. This is similar in construction to that uh, Chinese Type 31 that we talked about last episode. And while we're here, oh, you know what, I may need to change focus a bit. We have a beautiful dust cover. Mm. Now this works just like it did on the, well, the rifle that was based off a bit that we've already seen before, the Siamese RS-121. So it's a separate stroke of the hand in which you have to push forward on this guy and away from the action, a little bit stiff. There we go. And once she starts sliding forward, you'll go until you get a nice click. And peekaboo, our gas hole uh, exhaust ports are lined up with some cuts in the dust cover itself. Now the whole point of this assembly, of course, is to keep the action sealed away from muck and mud until you're ready to get into business. It allows you to fire one round, but gotta help if you try to extract it without remembering to slide this forward. Kijito Nambu himself said he was never happy with the fact that this required an extra motion, and we see him fix this matter on the Type 38. While we're in this position, I might as well take a look at the magazine, hmm. Which, it's kind of hard to tell, but the follower has been reshaped. It's much more aggressive about popping those rounds up in an attempt to solve the double feed issue. In other words, it's not a controlled feed. If we start to slide this bolt forward, and I'm sorry I don't have a dummy, but the extractor is not necessarily going to always uh, lip over the, extract, or the rim on the next cartridge until it's already in the chamber. They tried to make it so that it would. So we're a little undercut. And the idea is that as this bolt starts to push forward on a round, 
When it pops up, it should pop up very aggressively and get up behind that extractor and therefore hopefully eliminate double feeds. This was not a perfect solution. And again, we'll see the Mauser style controlled feed in the Type 38 after this gun, but it's something of an in-between. It probably used existing equipment and it was ready to rock and roll very quickly. The next biggest visual change to this from the Type 30 is the safety itself, which actually works exactly the same way. Pull it to the rear. Oh, <laughs> always easy to say and do without the camera around. Pull it to the rear, flip it up until she, and boy, is she aggressive with it. So let me snag her from the other direction. Oh God, she sucks my hand. There, boom. And it's actually a little awkward because it's offset slightly to the right. So I find that I often, when handling this gun, would kind of get to this position here and go, what's it doing, what's it doing? And then all of a sudden, it would just sort of get over center where it belongs. And then, oh boy, it also likes to do this Carcano thing. Not a perfect system, Nambu. There we go. It would snap in and then try to grab my finger in the same time. So I don't know that this is the best solution because of what you just saw but it's a lot simpler in construction. And we'll go ahead and see that by taking out the bolt. But as we do so, I again would like to point out a couple things. One, right at the front, see this lug? That is there explicitly to cover the right lug channel in order to keep gas from venting straight back here. It must have been a problem. And the safety itself, well, it has a big old gas shield behind it now, Big round circle with some texturing. That's gonna get familiar to those of you who know the Type 38, because again, this is just sort of a gas shield that's been added to the back of the gun in an attempt to, well, you know, keep more, or keep less gas rather from venting into the shooter's eye. As we release the bolt, I'll point out that this gun exclusively uses the smooth bolt release like the Type 30 carbine. So press that, pop out the bolt, no big difference. Oh, there. All right, we have both bolts where you can see them. The old Type 30 with its shallow hook that might have been a little painful because boy, they made this a lot wider. And we also now have the gas shield and a gas shield here for that uh, lug raceway when we're turned in. All right, other than that, what have we got? Well, if you look at the bolt handles, mm, this one's more pear shaped. It's been extended, elongated, give you a little bit more grip instead of the bulbous straight sphere. Uh, in addition, while this guy did have some gas venting options in his bolt body there and here, they have been improved with a much larger slot on the Type 35, same little hole there. And of course you would allow it to enter through the firing pin channel as well. If we're feeling the bolt faces, well, let me get you into position to see that. Sure enough, this guy being the Type 30 and this being the Type 35, there is, let me get this better on plane, there's an overhead lip here. Again, probably an attempt at a gas check, but also an attempt to make sure that you had a nice positive controlled feed right from the beginning. This reminds me a lot of some of the sort of intermediary Mausers that were attempting to have a better feed before he developed the full length extractor. And in this case, we're just wide open and flat. Now, as for disassembly, we start the same way as the Type 30 by rotating the bolt face and then wiggling her free, oh, there, that way, sorry. This guy escapes so easily once he's off that lug. As a matter of fact, the minute he turns over, he's free because all he has to do is pop off the front because he has a pin now. He's not actually in a dovetail like he was before. He's pinned to the front of the bolt face. So once we're down, we can come across the extractor largely works the same way and is fit the same way. Now, uh, in order to disassemble this, we no longer need a special tool. We're just gonna stand this bolt on its end and refocus our camera. If I depress on that firing pin, you notice, hmm, this back piece even rotate itself. It just sort of slipped free, right? So our gas check here can be rotated as long as the firing pin is being depressed onto the table, at which point, there we go. We remove this guy, release that pressure, and this will all come apart. So this has come out the rear, this will come out the rear, and out the front, we have our firing pin and spring. So compared to the Type 30, this is a much tidier package to deal with. Although I will say the bolt head is still a fair number of parts that really wanna come flying apart. Eh, ultimately no special tool. And I'm gonna be honest with you, no special fiddling with those two pieces of yoke. This I like a lot better. The new rifle would be paired with a slightly modified Type 30 bayonet. They put a hooked flat spring down its spine. This allowed it to lock onto the sheath, much like the contemporary Japanese swords and their scabbards. 
All of this would be adopted by the Imperial Navy in late 1902, making this the Type 35 rifle. Now, let's go ahead and get a look inside. In order to load up the Type 35, we'll first have to push the dust cover forward. Now we can insert our five round stripper clip and, well, strip. This rapidly fills up our staggered magazine. From here, we'll just manually work the bolt forward and turn it down into lock. Note that the forward locking lugs are integral to the body, along with this extra gas check lug. The actual bolt head is separate and non-rotating. Attached to it are the extractor and the ejector, which is of the sliding type that will strike against the bolt stop. The extractor pulls the rim of the case and the ejector strikes the bolt stop and flings the case right out. Looking further inside the bolt, we can see the firing pin, which is under constant spring tension forward, but is held rearward by this cocking piece, which is in turn attached to the safety lever. Releasing the cocking piece causes the firing pin to strike the primer, discharging the rifle. As we bolt open, the cocking piece is guided back slightly. This attracts the firing pin enough for safe loading. Full cock isn't achieved until we bolt back forward, with the cocking piece catching on the sear. The trigger group is of a standard Mauser configuration. The sear holds back the cocking piece, with its rear constantly pivoted upwards thanks to a coil spring at its front. The vertical pin at its front also serves as an out-of-battery safety, as it cannot rise unless a corresponding notch in the bolt is present. The sear can be lowered by pulling the trigger. This is a two-stage affair, meaning we first hit a flat, and then we go over the second hump, blammo. This is the safety, not hook thingy. Just pull, turn 90 degrees, and release. Now the cocking piece lug rests in a separate channel, preventing the firing pin from ever reaching the primer. To ready the arm again, just pull back on the hook and turn it back. Now the cocking piece is back on the sear and ready to drop. The Type 35 also has some modification to its follower, which now attempts to pop up the rear of the cartridge sooner. This was an attempt to prevent double feeding. Once the magazine is empty, the rear of the follower rises to block the bolt, signaling a need to reload. Okay, let's take her to the range. <laughs> Clicky clack. Uh, now, as cool as the Type 35 is, it's basically a stopgap. The Army would soon realize they too had some issues with the Type 30, and Kijito Nambu would be put to work again, this time making much more severe changes and resulting in the Type 38. For those of you bad at math, that's just three years later after the Type 35. And the Type 38 was one hell of a rifle. So the Type 35 was never developed into a carbine, and while there were some minor changes over production, like changing the safety hook check ring into stripes. It was really just a singular gun. Overall, it's estimated roughly 38,200 Type 35 rifles were produced, with production likely falling off fairly quickly. Technically, they were in time for the Russo-Japanese War, although I'm unsure how many of them were fielded for that conflict. I still seem to see a lot of images of naval forces with Marauder rifles, supposedly from that war. 
1909, the Imperial Japanese Navy requested that the Tokyo Artillery Arsenal compare the Type 35 to the newer Type 38. And for anyone familiar with the Type 38, the outcome should be obvious. We actually don't have the results. I can guess what they would be. So we at least know that the Type 35 was standard until 1909. Uh, when the Navy officially switched off this particular gun is currently unknown, but it appears they were fully committed to the Type 38 by 1914 and the start of World War I. However, Type 35s definitely remained in service for some years, probably being slowly pushed into more secondary roles before being surplus. I say this because I have seen it in wartime footage from late in the First World War. This somewhat awkward guard is armed with a Type 35 as he watches over these officers meeting with white Russians at Archangel. Unlike the Type 30, it doesn't appear that significant numbers of Type 35s were converted into training rules. Instead, many of them seem to now display markings from the Kingdom of Siam. This of course being their royal chakra marking, usually located on the receiver bridge. Supposedly, like the Type 30, some 35s were uh, turned up in captured equipment during the Second World War, so it seems they held on in a sort of deep reserve duty into the 1940s. It's also worth mentioning a number of Type 35 receivers were used to complete emergency assembly of rifles during that same conflict. These are known by collectors as the O245 because they were a 1902 rifle modified in 1945. Generally of somewhat poor quality, they represent a hybridization of the Type 35 and the Type 99 rifles. And hopefully we'll get a chance to cover them another day. Now before we wrap this up, I'd like to make something of a personal point. The Type 30 was a hybridization of the Monlicker, Mauser, and some Japanese concepts, all overseen by Nadia Kira Arisaka, so I think it's fair to call it an Arisaka. The Type 35 was a modification of the Type 30, overseen by Kijito Nanbu, most accurately we'd call this an Arisaka Nanbu. The Type 38, a rifle we've covered on another episode, really shed its Monlicker heritage, instead it's much more of a hybrid of a Mauser 95 and a Mauser 98. It also has significant changes that are uniquely Japanese and largely developed by Kijito Nanbu. I think it would probably best be called the Nanbu Rifle. But Arisaka, the name, seems to have stuck around anyway. The man himself was awarded the Order of the Golden Kite Second Class for his sound advice on placing artillery during the Russo-Japanese War, particularly in Port Arthur. He would later be promoted to Lieutenant General and ultimately became a Baron. During his career, he was recognized as an excellent strategist and aided Japan in its attempts at rapid modernization. In 1911, he would suffer a mild cerebral hemorrhage and later passed away on January 12, 1915. Kijito Nambu would struggle to see his automatic pistol, also of 1902 vintage, adopted. We have a whole episode on that front and one on his Type 38 rifle, one of the best service rifles ever made. There's certainly a lot of extra room to explore his history, so I won't wrap him out today. To be honest, our episode on that Type 38 is starting to feel a little dated too, but I think we'll wait a bit longer before making any adjustments. I don't want to flood you guys with a bunch of the same. Instead, we'll just refocus back on the Type 35, however short its career might have been, and we'll get May's opinion on this frankly beautiful and very rare firearm. All right, once more we've made room for May. Hello! And we have, thanks to a generous donor, the loan of one Type 35 rifle. And I also have to check my email. Getting your phone out. Yes, because we always try to make our donors happy. This is true. They tell us, I asked them what they want to be called. I oh, forgot yeah. to do that originally in the series and it got really confusing. It did. So uh, I asked our, our loaner on this case. Okay. And it's a rare gun, so we have to make him happy. Am I not saying his name? Uh, well, I am supposed to say his name, okay. but I was given a, I just said, how do you want to be called for the thanks? Okay. This is the first time I've ever been given this request. Okay. Uh, it was requested to say thank you to Dominic Cairo of the Kobayashi Non-For-Profit Organization of Japan. I'm sure it's a is reference that, to something. I don't know what. Is that actually a, a play, a thing? I don't know. Dominic's an unusual and very friendly person. I'm actually glad That's to true. be his friend, yeah. but nice I don't boy. know what half of what he says means. No. Yeah, I, I don't have a it. TV. <laughs> All right, so. <laughs> it's actually true, we don't have a TV. I don't own a TV. Which is apparently very strange. Our neighbor was very weirded out by yeah. that. <laughs> Bloke on the range sent me a DVD player. He did. I don't have a TV. <laughs> no, now we're going to get a TV in the mail. <laughs> I don't want a TV. I don't wait to hook it up anyway. He's fine. We're fine. Okay. Everything's good. Okay. Bloke stops sending things. Um. <laughs> All right, this is off the rails already. Oh, it's yeah, good. it's good. It's a good show. Now, yeah. 
Um, thank you, Dominic. The yeah. Type 35 is a very unusual uh, firearm. It is. In the sense that it was very shortly produced, and it's like a weird further hybridization of a hybrid gun that then has some very unique features. Yes. I can How tell. do you feel about all this? I can tell coming from the type. Actually, I got the Type 30 right here. Yeah, so. you do. Coming from the Type 30. 98% of it seems the same, if I'm honest. Yeah, it's got similar length, weight, well, actual narrowness to it. That all doesn't seem that unusual. What I did, first thing I played with unusually was the uh, dust cover, because I wanted to open it up to pull the action, or to be able to manipulate the action. But uh, this dust cover is incredibly Thai to me. Like, it makes me think of all the Thai Mausers that we've Yeah, we before. did the whole um, Siamese. Siamese turn Thai. Yeah. There's a whole history there, too, by the way. Both are correct in a way. Mm -hmm. Um... It's not like the Type 38 dust covers at all, where it's integrated into the bolt manipulating. No. So this is where we've gone sort of out of order, unfortunately. Because we have the Type 30, mm -hmm. then you have the Type 35, mm -hmm. and around the same time as the Type 35 is being started up, right. the uh, Siam comes along and says, hey, we want rifles too, but we want them to be Mausers. Mm -hmm. And Japan goes, are you sure you don't want this new thing we're making? And shows them that. And they go, no. Well, I guess we'll take the dust cover. And so you end up with this Mauser that has the same sliding dust cover system. Okay. Kajudo Nambu himself said he wasn't entirely happy with the solution, and then later developed the Type 38 with the sliding dust cover that stays with the bolt. Mm -hmm. So that's a separate hand motion to open the dust cover. It is. Um, and definitely now unusual. twice you've accidentally knocked it off. Accidentally. Hey, no, I did not this time. I was very careful. Yeah, go ahead and close it. that dust cover then. Oh, I'm really nervous about closing it because I just seem to have a knack for. Ah, suck it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Got you, it. You have to flex out to bring it's, it back. It's so delicate. In the course of filming this episode, we've accidentally pulled that thing off the gun like three times. Oh, God. Yeah, I'm just, I'm having to be, even now, it still wants to come off. It's still thinking about it. And I know some of you are like, oh, you sure it's not a Thai one that's been put on there? No, it's original yeah, Japanese. Checked, it's just yeah. a little loose. So, uh, I mean, to be fair, it's also, you know, over 100 years old now. Yeah, eventually it's going to wear. Um, anything else that stands out as unique about this gun? Well, um, something that's pretty unique and also seen before, these quadrant sights are huge. They look like the Dutch mom liquors. Yeah, they're like massive. They are huge. And they stick up. Yeah, oh, it's got the nice clicky clacky bit that you, you can do. You know what I like about this better? Than, this one. Huh? You know what I like better about this than the Dutch mom liquor? What? The handguard. The handguard is really built up around them, and it's very thick. It is. It very much is. It's going to protect those a fair bit, I would say. I mean, it's almost unnecessary. Those things are huge anyway. Yeah, they really are. But there's not a lot to bump them. This thing's already starting to have some cracking and gouging at the handguard where it's yeah, been whacked. Yeah, right there. You're it hasn't wrong. failed. Like, it is actually kind of a testament to how well this handguard is structured. It's, light, it's constructed as light wood, mm -hmm. and it's taken a beam right here. I mean, yeah. you can tell real bad whack, yeah. and there's cracking. Mm -hmm. It hasn't failed or blown apart, Didn't and it hasn't been glued up. We were handling yeah, I know. They're actually pretty robust. Yeah. Um, Not too I bad. I think, other than, well, what well, else? We've got the safety. That's different looking. Yeah, your whole, it, your whole cocking piece is actually different. Yeah, I will say automatically when I go here to grip it with my finger, it does feel a little bit better. Like it doesn't yeah. feel like that narrow hook from the Type 30. Yeah. It's not punishing your hand. No, this is definitely not punishing my hand. It's All much right. smoother. So you pull it back. Yep. And you turn it. Yep, and you drop it into the oh, channel. Oh, you're doing what I did. It's off center to the right. Oh, man. Keep, no, keep rotating. Oh, yeah. Right. See how it's off center? I forgot. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's a bit weird. weird. And then at one point, I think I managed to accidentally decock it, but not like manage to drop it all the way in somehow. That's because you rotated it until it felt centered to you like you would the hook. As a mm -hmm. matter of fact, having handled the Type 30 makes you worse at handling the Type 35 that safety. That would explain that because, because I handled the Type 30 before. You expect to take the center of the hook and center it vertically on the bolt. Makes sense because there's a channel there. You're thinking, oh, I need to line it up with the channel. The hook on that, well, paddle, I guess, is slightly offset to the right. Mm hmm. Definitely throws you off a little bit. Yeah, it's weird how much it does to anybody, not everybody, but people who have handled Type 30s. But I've even handled this one, and I still managed to do that right here. Yeah, do it again without without really like, right. so remember, you got to go over center. Yeah, okay, go okay. over center. Okay. No problem. Now that I'm thinking about it, sure. Now but try to I... go to the center. Yeah, yeah and, like, then, and then oh. yeah, exactly that <laughs> I weird like that. <laughs> yeah. Why does it do that? It's like all of a sudden it's a Carcano. Ah, I don't like that. That's super weird. I know it's because you're not quite rotated all the way over. It's oh. it's very bizarre. Anyway, that's um, nerve wracking. I know. I don't. I'm gonna be honest. I don't really care. I like the paddle over the hook. Yeah. But I don't like the offset 
over center thing. Yeah, that is a bit unusual as mm. a user. As a user, if I was coming into this fresh, you want it to be as stupid, you know, proof as possible. I feel like it fitting into the like lining up with the channel makes the most sense. All right, so now we're let's talk about loading the rifle. Yep. Any difference? Remember that being pretty straightforward action, just as smooth as the Type Thirty, I would say. I don't mm -hmm. think it binds quite as bad if I over rotate. Yeah, that one's in better shape than this one too. Yeah, it's true. So it could be a matter of just being in better shape that it's a little bit smoother. Okay. Recoil, not really much difference between that and the long rifle. It's all the same to me. And sights. then the trigger, pretty comparable. Obviously, sight stiff. We, yeah, we talked about that. Obvious yeah, but sight look down. difference. Um, just because they're quadrants doesn't mean they're cut differently. I honestly, I kind of, I don't think they're necessary. You got me going now. Hold on, I want to look too. Okay, it's so got I've got a very deep V. I've got a deep wide V. What do you got? Deep wide V. Oh, it's the, the same sight front. picture. It's literally the same, except now I've got these big old quadrant sights sticking up, which aren't really critical. So are they interrupting your uh, peripheral vision at all? Or I they... mean, a little bit because they're there. If they just weren't there, it would be better. Are they trenching like a Gewehr ninety eight though? It is. It is creating a trench in which for you to automatically focus your eyes on. So maybe yeah. technically you could get faster. They're it, fairly narrow they're though. Critical. I feel like a guy would have to be minimum 300 meters away to disappear behind those though. Okay, how many men could he fit behind those sights? Let's find hey, out. I mean, it's don't get me wrong, it's a distraction, but they're also way more, I feel like I'm more confident marching with these Fair. because those ladder sights are so easy to bang out of order. I could see that. Like You're this, this is better. Those are more robust. I also like this better in terms of like, I'm sighted real long. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm like, oh, long range sight. And then somebody comes up real close and you're like, oh, God, bam. And then you and I don't right, want right. to do that too many times. But, yeah. but um, you know, you just slap it down to zero mm -hmm. and then turn and fire. Right. Right. Whereas I guess. OK, so you're here and, and then you say fold you're four. up here. So let's say you're like doing yeah. some crazy stuff going. On. Oh, God. Yeah. OK, same and thing. They fall flat. They're not a step ladder. You can do that up, without so. damaging. Them, yeah. Too. But um, I guess you're right, because then you can go right back to your volley position. Maybe yeah, literally. Know. Like, these are better for a battle site fall down. That's probably actually, we're learning something now, that's probably actually why the Japanese did not go for the stanza system on yeah. the sides, because a lot of them will have tangent slash ladder. Right. And they just went all ladder. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah, all right, sure. Uh, anything else critically different? I don't think there's anything critically different for how the handling It's kind went. of boring. Yeah, not, well. <laughs> the gun itself is gorgeous, but it's just sort of like, okay, Type 30 with a dust cover, you know? Like, That's kind of it. And then when you think about it, like I said, compared to the 38, it's just not an integral dust cover. And frankly, I find it kind of useless. I can't imagine there would be many times in which I would want the dust cover there because it's going to interrupt my loading and my extraction. So realistically, the only thing I could have is maybe a round chambered in that state. And I can get one off, but I'm going to have to get that dust cover forward and, you know, before off quickly before ejecting. Yeah, I think I think the integrated dust cover, especially for naval rifle, is better than just having a detachable canvas cover. Mm -hmm. So it's already better than a regular canvas cover, which yeah. is absolutely necessary for that rifle sure. because it's stunk mm -hmm. at dealing with mud and muck, apparently. Yep. This is from Japan, not from me. I didn't no. claim so already it's a better option than just having another accessory. So all right. it come, it's on the gun. It's already there. Right. Point there. We have improved gas mitigation. We have a gas shield that that doesn't have. That's true. We it have does have that little better gas shield there. for your eyes. Yep. Is there any argument in your mind that this is somehow inferior to the type 30? Not exceptionally so. I can't think of an exception. Like, can you reason. think of anything that's inferior? The sights, I guess? Like I said, maybe uh, you could argue between quadrant versus ladder, but then again, there, there's some pros and cons with that for both of them. So right. you could um, you could argue they negate themselves. In theory, you could dislike the quadrant. Mm -hmm. And in theory, you could find this a little awkward because of the over-center thing. Right. Other than that, there's no way to possibly claim that this gun is, is inferior, inferior to, to that. The this yeah. is clearly an upgrade of that. Right. I also think it upholds my sense that the uh, export monlickers is what they were looking at because of the use of a quadrant sight. I would agree. Uh, now, both of these guns remind me of another gun. Mm. And I haven't talked to you about this at all, so we're going to get a live reaction, oh, everybody. God. Yeah. He loves those. Yeah. Both you don't have of that these guns. All the way, by the way, that dust cover. It's only partially closed. Oh, it's closed. only partially yeah, closed. Yeah, it's only partially Let me just closed. see if I can disrail the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> it's easier to open this to I'm close. I'm really good at disrailing it. No, like just clunk. Multiple yeah. takes, I think, for that, if I remember correctly. All right, all right, mystery rifle. Okay, mystery rifle. You can't think of a gun that reminds you, especially of that one, because it doesn't have the dust cover. Okay. But both of these are, again, Monlicker export, Mauser export hybrids. Okay. At their core, that's what they are. Sure. You can't think of any other gun that reminds you of that. Um, 
The Portuguese Vaguero. Oh, God. That was the 1906? Four. Four? Okay. Three? Crap, now you're doing it to me. <laughs> you got it in my head. We'll put it on the screen because now she's freaking me out. No, it's got to be four. Anyway, yes, the... Um, God, it's been forever since the Vaguero. Yeah, but guess what that was? Small bore, low recoil hybrid of the Mauser and the Monlicker export rifles. Okay. No one, I've found no one who's made this comparison, and yet... There it is. It is, the, both of them come from the same design doctrine. We're going to take these two things and mush them together. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Vaguero is. I would have never thought of the Vaguero. It's like, narrow, I it's got this weird bolt thing going on. Mm -hmm. It's The Vaguero is right there. I mean, very similar in outcome. And yet I guarantee you they weren't referencing the Type 30 when they made the Vaguero, which mm -hmm. came after. Dang. Yeah. Look at that. Mind blown. Yeah, oh, good job. I'm very proud of you. Hey, I had double in the in these two sets of episodes. Uh -huh. I came around to the idea that it's not the Gavar 88 that that's based off of. It's based off of the export monlickers, per, basically exemplified by what would be adopted by the Dutch. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh my god, the Vigero is the same design doctrine, which is just... I'm sorry. It's really fun. I get it. So You're now, exciting. You're making connections that were previously not obvious oh, I guess or there's present. At least, there's at least two people out there that probably own one of these and a big arrow, and now they're going, oh. Yeah, I know. They're totally like, <laughs> I want to put them on the table together and look at them I next to each other. I do it myself. I don't own a big arrow. We don't have one here right now. I'm alone. He's really I'm excited saying. to have Revolver Night, where he lays out all the revolvers That's in line with That's a separate topic, other. okay? Don't don't bring everybody into Revolver Night, okay. where I roll around on the revolvers. You don't roll around. He just yeah, puts I, them in I order say, of year. And then I say, I I'm a revolver, <laughs> and then I roll. <laughs> <laughs> you started off topic. All right. Um, it's, I'm really, you know the funny thing is? Yeah. I'm in love with this rifle. It is a beautiful rifle. It's a great, it's a wonderful example. It's an actually fantastic shape. I'm, I'm quite jelly. You know, Kijito Nambu had a, uh, a sentiment that a rifle must be beautiful so that the soldiers will maintain it properly. I could understand that, actually, weirdly. And... That dude knew how to make a beautiful rifle. Really I did. mean, the Type 30 is a handsome looking gun. We called it elegant the other day. Mm -hmm. Just the little improvements that were done to this. This is There's something between here and here that I can't yeah. put my finger on. There's an elegance that we're starting to see come out that right. we then get into the 38 with, especially. Oh, and the 38s are just... So, mm -hmm. uh, fantastic gun. Oh, yeah. 100%. Um, extremely rare. Sorry, everybody. Extremely rare. Yes. But at least we all got to see it. It's true. And you and I got to temporarily handle it. So thank you again. Dominic. Dominic with your whole title, Dominic. <laughs> I can't remember it off the top of my head. I'm so sorry. Dominic, the only one who also liked the mustard. So. Wait, really? I think so. Oh. He was the only one that liked the thiasis mustard. No, no, it wasn't that. my mustard. I know. that We you had, had dinner that with him and there was I mustard involved. Yeah, I, get, I remember. Anyway, uh, we're getting way too far into podcast. Okay. Point. That is something reserved for patrons. If you like the off-topic crap uh and the behind the scenes show goings as far yeah. as production and uh future insights to what may be to come mm -hmm. you can check us out on utreon patreon that sort of thing yep. and we always put in the updates and everything but otherwise i hope you guys are enjoying the show yeah any final thoughts on this one um fantastic piece i'm glad i got to try it it really does feel like a stepping stone between the 30 and the 38 that it kind of shows some transitioning where they were really trying to make vast improvements on this guy and that there is still more to come with that. Yeah, this is one of those beautiful times when you can you can quite literally see this, the, the progress. The mindset. Yeah, where it's like kind of oh, going down the I, I see where they were trying to work with this, but it wasn't quite there yet. They just need to tweak it here and it'll be even better. Yeah. I like it. It's really kind of cool to be able to see those step stones just kind of be propped up a little bit for yeah. me. All right. Well, I think that's got us covered. Yeah. Uh, you guys have a good one. Night, everybody. But in a in a moment's notice, uh oh, you could end up with dad's legs wrapped around your head. Okay. And then he would yell, speak forth, oh toothless one, and fart on you. <laughs> I'm also looking at books for things three months from now to make sure I'm not missing books on it. You know what I mean? Or mm -hmm. that the book completely explains. Because when you do it, especially when you start going chronological with it in that ripper section, um, in the sorted section rather, mm -hmm. you start to notice where you're like, wait, they don't really explain how that.
all this happen? Mm -hmm. And you start looking around for more sources. And so you can end up kind of stuck. Like I, there's been times before where I'm like, I need another source and I'll go digging and I'll finally find something. And so then I have to go back, punch it all into my raw notes and then copy paste it out of there to make sure that I still have it in the raws because going into the future, I may, I need, I need everything to exist in the raw note form no matter what mm -hmm. so that I never lose it. And I realize there's some stories I need to tell. Oh, Early yes, there CNR are. Soul stories. So when we're done here, I will make a note. Actually, where's my phone? I will make a podcast email right now while okay. we're talking. Okay. Uh, early in the early in the Sea Marshall days, I had to kind of fake it till I made it. Foot in the door salesmanship things. Mm -hmm. um, but some of them are quite humorous. Yes. And so they had our buddy laughing the other night. Yeah. Uh, and up to the point that you're like, I guess I should tell these on here. Right. So I can't tell them all at once because it's just going to be like a, a fit. But I'm basically going to start adding them to. Uh, to the my beginning list. or something. So, like yeah. the first time I went to the gray room, yep, it's a really good story. 